Good morning, everyone. Welcome on the 6th of September, this Sunday morning. It's a nice day out. Uh, before I get started, uh, let's go through the bulletin. Are we still having <clears throat> cabinet meetings and board meetings on Wednesday? Did I get it right? <laughs> All right. We will be having our meetings. Um, Pastor Ed's still doing Bible studies on Wednesdays online. But not this Wednesday, because we're doing the cabinet meetings. So I put that in the bulletin, but uh, just be aware that it's not going to take place. And uh, next Sunday, same time, same place, worship service, and you can find us online. Um, I thought, oh, yeah, it, uh, it, the best way is uh, YouTube, bit.ly forward slash Warden Church. And we're on Facebook if you're a Facebook follower. Do I have anything from the congregation before we start? Jamie. Yes. So um, next. Figurehead who has no power. <laughs> That's who I am. The National Association Committee for overseeing the meeting. Um, as the host group, we need to have a committee to be uh, overseeing everything. So I am starting to form a committee. So if anybody is interested in helping with organizing, all we have to organize is the worship service and um, having a little like host table at the, the convention so that if people have questions, we can help answer their questions. Um, and then putting it together, any of the special things that we want to do, if we want to do a tour of Spokane or whatever. So there's all kinds of fun little things that we get to be involved with. So if anyone is interested in being part of that committee, please let me know. I'm, I'm looking for one to two uh, participants from each of our churches in our region. So we'll have a group of maybe 14 to 16 people, hopefully. So we'll have lots of great ideas. So please contact me if you're interested. Thank you. You're welcome. Anything else? If not, we'll go to the bulletin for the call to worship, and that'll be found from Psalm 113. <clears throat> the Lord our God sits high in heaven. From on high, he looks down to see the sky and the earth. May the Lord's name be praised from the rising sun in the east to the place where the sun goes down. God lifts poor people out of the dirt. God takes beggars from the garbage dump and makes those people his own. Praise the Lord. Lords of the Lord, praise him. Praise the Lord's name. Our first song this morning is uh, found in hymnal 243, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty.
Our first Bible reading this morning would be out of the Old Testament from the book of Isaiah. I'll read uh, from chapter 6, starting at verse 1. If you'd like to follow along, that's on page 1068 in your pew Bible. So, Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on a throne, high and exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphs, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their face, faces, with two wings they covered their feet, and with two wings they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. And for our New Testament reading, I'll be reading from the book of Ephesians, from chapter 2, starting at verse 1. And if you'd like to follow along, that would be page 1818 in your pew Bible. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature objects of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even though when we were dead in transgression, it is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incarnation incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And now we'll go to the congregation for our joys and spiritual needs. This is just a reminder that during the congregation's sharing of joys and concerns, we'll be turning the sanctuary microphone off to protect the privacy of those in the meeting house. As always, if you have something about which you'd like to have others join you in prayer, you can contact Pastor Ed or pretty much anyone connected with the church, and we'll put you on the prayer chain and lift your concerns to the Lord. In the meantime, please join us in an attitude prayer, and we'll have a few moments of silence before we turn the sound back up and join together in the Lord's Prayer.
Let's pray together. The creator of the universe calls us to leave the darkness behind and live in the light. Lord Jesus, you who lived and died and rose again, you greet us today. The one who danced at creation's birth now calls us into your presence, and so we come to worship. But sometimes, God, your word is hard for us. Sometimes, Lord, we don't want to hear you. Sometimes, God, we'd rather sing our nice hymns and pray our comforting prayers and turn away from what you require. So send your Holy Spirit that we might turn to you. In the word read and proclaimed, that we would listen and understand and change and obey. Forgive us, good Lord, and help us to turn our sorrow into action, our failure into change, and our guilt into grace. God, who makes us with the earth, God, who gives us to the world, God, with us in our struggles, hear our fears and our needs and our joys. Hold our hand as you walk beside us. Advise us, encourage us, guide us. We pray for peace throughout our communities, both those that are close to us and those abroad. Let your grace be seen. We pray for the church, no matter where it's meeting, no matter how it meets. We give thanks for the faithfulness of the church community and its undergirding of prayer. And we pray for a desire to experience the joy of a deeper fellowship with all you've created. May your work be seen by us and in us. We pray for ourselves, for, for those people that we're missing so much, for those that we are concerned about their health and their well-being. We bring our personal concerns to you because you're the one who knows and understands our deepest thoughts. We've mentioned some of those things in our bulletin, and yet there are so many other uh, conditions and people about which we don't share. We ask for support and perseverance when we struggle and a sustaining sign when we get things right. We lift up those who are beside us today, whether they are physically next to us or, or joining us online. We acknowledge and respect that there are things that they can't share out loud either. And we seek a sense of impatience for change rather than accepting the way things are. Most of all, Lord, we pray for peace in our hearts and communities and May the fuller joys of Christ in our lives be seen through Jesus who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let's sing together, And Can It Be That I Should Gain? Now, this is on page 332 of our hymnals here in the building, and it will be up on the screen. Uh, and when there are songs that have five verses, often I will have the lady sing the third verse and the guy sing the fourth verse. Uh, this time, what I'd like us to do is to sing verses 1, 2, and 3, and then responsively read verse 4, and then we'll jump back in and sing verse 5. Okay, so we'll sing one, two, and three. We'll read together verse four, and we'll sing verse five. And can it be that I should gain?
Long my imprisoned spirit lay, fast bound in sin and nature's night. Thine eye diffused a quickening ray. I woke, the dungeon flamed with light. My chains fell off, my heart was free. I rose, went forth, and followed thee. My chains fell off, my heart was free. I rose, went forth, and followed thee. And now we'll ask the Holy Spirit to come and quicken us this morning. Bring us to life in Him. We don't want this just to be a religious ceremony, but to experience the living Word of God among us through the preaching of His Word and through the interaction with how He leads and guides us. So let's pray together. Holy Spirit, You are the very breath of God We look all the way back into Genesis and see the picture that that God made humanity out of mud, formed us out of the dust, and breathed into us, and we became alive. Holy Spirit, we'd ask that you do that same kind of process in us this morning. If there is anything dead in us or faltering, that you would bring it to life and strengthen us to cooperate with this process of being made to be more like Jesus. Spirit, if there is anything in us that is distracting us from that, if there's anything that's merely human in this time, we pray that we would set that aside, that it would be forgotten, and only that which is from you would remain. Give us life. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. I have to tell you that one of my favorite verses in all of Scripture is Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and 10. I love these verses, and and I talk about them a, a lot, especially with people who maybe think that that being a follower of Jesus is about enacting a certain ritual religious ceremony. That, that's not it at all. But here, here's the thing that I have noticed this, this week especially. Um, I have focused so much on Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, and then 10, that I, I may have missed some pretty great stuff in verses 1 through 7. So I want to talk about that this morning. And I discovered this really, really neat idea that I did not see well before. That what is what we're going to talk about. And that's about zombie Christians. Now, zombies, we, we talk about zombies in popular culture and, you know, the undead that walk among us. Well, we're going to see that kind of in the text this morning. And I want you guys to know that that's not just some flight of fantasy of science fiction or horror, there are real, actual zombie processes that happen in real life on this planet. It's not just a work of fiction. In the insect world, 
zombification and control of the undead is a is a regular thing. There's a wasp in Costa Rica. I won't go into too much detail because frankly it's kind of gross, but I will tell you. The Costa Rican wasp uh, will plant its eggs on some poor spider's belly. And when those larvae hatch and they get to a certain uh, stage in their growth cycle, they inject a, an enzyme into the spider, its host, and they take over its brain. And they force this spider, who has been making, you know, webs all its life, to make a web it's never made before, a very unusual looking web. In fact, this web looks more like a sling than anything else, because it's not designed to catch any other food that's coming its way. Oh no. This wasp larva makes the spider spin its own death coffin. And then, once it's done doing that, the larva kills the spider and then wraps a cocoon, and now it has a safe place for the cocoon because the spider's just made it, and then continues to eat that spider. It's now the long-term food storage until the wasp emerges from its cocoon, a full-grown wasp, and goes off to do the same thing. And this is not an unusual activity. This same kind of process happens with wasps and cockroaches and flatworms and ants and horsehair worms and crickets. And some of these processes are really, really complex. If you go to the, the website, I've linked to uh, a, an article that describes a whole bunch of them. If you're not into that kind of stuff, I don't blame you. You don't have to read it. It's not necessary to understand the sermon. But that idea of, of the dead seemingly animated and walking is right here in the text. I couldn't ignore it. And so if you will turn with me in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 2, we're going to look at how the dead walk among us. Ephesians chapter 2. Now, we need to understand that every Christian is on a journey Every Christian is on a journey, and there today we're going to look at two stages of this journey. And the first one is the dead part. From undead stumbling is what we're looking at first. So let's just read verses 1 through 3. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. As for you, Paul writes to the Ephesians, you were dead. You were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of the world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature objects of wrath. Okay, so the first thing I got to mention here is, um, I know that I, I kind of, smack the NIV translators around a few times because maybe I don't like the way they may have shaded one particular translation or another, but they are punny and I love that part. They start right up front, you were dead, and then it goes on to talk about how they lived, how we lived. If you're dead, you're not actually living, you're zombies, you're undead. And in fact, if verse one here talks about transgressions and sins. The transgression, that word means what is, you've unintentionally trespassed. Um, you've gone someplace where you shouldn't ought to have gone. And the word sins is much more intentional. Those are intentional violations. But either way, whether you have stumbled where you shouldn't have gone or whether you intentionally broke the law, the wages of sin is death. We were dead. And so when we get to verse 2 and it says, in which you used to live, the word live isn't actually in the original. That word life isn't there. The, the word there is walked. And that's the thing that made me think about zombies. Now, I don't know about you, but I, I'm not a huge horror movie fan, but I know, even I know, there are two classes of zombies. There are the slow shuffling ones that just walk around and mumble and say brains, brains, brains. And we can thank George Romero for that, Night of the Living Dead, a movie that that guy made and it was very creepy and gross and slow paced because zombies are slow. 
and the poor guy forgot to put a copyright notice onto it, and it immediately went into the public domain. Some dead people are slow. And that's the impression, that's the, the thing that, that popped into my head when I read this. The, the zombies that are out now from I Am Legend fame, short story that was written a long time ago and has been made into three movies so far, those zombies are much faster. And frankly, I think fast zombies are scarier. The George Romero zombies are scary, they're very persistent, but in a good brisk walk, you're, you're gonna be fine. You know, just don't stop to tie your shoe and you'll be okay. The fast zombies, you, you have to barricade someplace because they aren't going to get you. The reason why this is important for us to think about is because we are surrounded by zombies. In fact, we used to be zombies. We were dead. And we used to stumble around. We used to walk, verse 2, in this... Uh, kingdom of death. In fact, there's another thing I, I'm not a big fan of. The, the original doesn't say kingdom because Satan isn't a king. At most, he's a pretender prince. Jesus is king. Jesus is king. Amen. Thank you. Satan, the best he can hope for is Prince John. And not just any, you know, manly, strong Prince John in the, in the Robin Hood. No, I'm thinking of Prince John in the Robin Hood animated, you know, <laughs> bring me my luggage. He's not, he's not scary. He just wants us to think he's scary. Everything that Old Scratch does to get us to follow him is a lie. And so many people buy into it. I always wonder why. Well, because their brains don't work because they're dead. But this is not me pointing fingers at the world. This is me extending a hand to the world because I was dead too. We all were. We were dead. We were following after these taunts, these desires of our dead flesh. You know, I, I kind of tease the George Romero zombies, but they were persistent and they were focused. You never heard one of George Romero uh, Romero's zombies walk around and mutter spleen or foot. Nope, they, brains. That's what they wanted. That was all they were about. They didn't have working brains themselves and they thought they could get them that way. I know this is gross. It's supposed to be gross. Because if we are willing to settle for living in this dead situation, of course we're going to be surrounded by rot. And do you notice that the world lately seems to smell a little bit? The, the, the rot is rising to the surface and making itself known? There's the reason right there. They are following after something that isn't life. They are animated in their disobedience. We all used to act like that, verse 3. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. We all used to be drawn by our flesh to follow those deadly desires. Now notice something. There's something that's, that's right at the, the end of this verse that I really take exception to. Like the rest, we were by nature objects of wrath. Now, I asked Jamie about this because I wanted to make sure that, that my thoughts weren't awry. When you hear that phrase, does it make you think that we are the object of God's wrath? I know it certainly did me the, the first, I don't know, 50 times I read it. We are not objects to God. We are people. We are children. And in fact, the original language, if you have a King James Bible, it will say that we are children of wrath. But that's the thing. God doesn't conceive us in wrath. That's not where we come from. So the wrath that's being talked about here isn't God's wrath at all. It's the wrath that is the result of sin, of disobedience. James chapter 1 says, God does not tempt anyone, 
to evil, nor is he tempted by anyone. But each one is tempted when, by his own evil desire, he is dragged away and enticed. And then, after desire has conceived, children, conception, uh, after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. That's the wrath that's going on here. This is not God is mad at us because we are sinners. God loves us while we are sinners, so much so that he sent Jesus. There should be an amen there. Okay? We are rescued. We are quickened. We'll, we'll come back to that idea in a moment. This undead stumbling isn't God's idea. This is not our original design specifications at all. Originally, God made us, breathed the spirit into us, brought us to life, set us in the garden, set us up with all the fruit and veggies we could all eat. Don't eat those. Those aren't good for you. Everything else is yours. And the snake just couldn't let it be. I think that's because the snake... Satan, the devil, whatever you want to call him, Mr. Adversary himself, is jealous. He doesn't want to see God in the position of prominence. And so he will do whatever he can to create his own system, except let's be honest, the devil can't create anything. He can corrupt, he can twist, but he can't create. So he took this amazing system that God had set up and he decided he would bend it. He would shape, uh, 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 not shape, the word I'm, uh, twist it out of alignment. Not that I would know this personally, but I have it in good uh, faith that if you park too close to a curb at too high of a velocity, you can bend the whole alignment out of, the whole frame of your car out of alignment. I don't know that myself <laughs> from experience. But I do know that when you drive a car like that, it does this. It's out of alignment. And those who have not been brought to life yet, their whole lives are shaky. And they look for stability wherever they can find it. I saw the, the funniest little video uh, yesterday. Uh, for those of you who don't watch Star Trek, I'm, I'm sorry. But of course, you know, as the part of the story, every once in a while you'll have a bad guy and he'll shoot, uh, you know, an energy bolt at the ship, and the whole ship will rock. Well, sorry to tell you the truth, but there is no actual ship. It's just a set. And it's very, very, very expensive to make a, sh a set that shakes on cue. It's much cheaper to just tell the actors, we're going to shake on one, three, two, one. And then all of the actors... When you watch it in the show, it's very convincing. But if you ever get a chance to see a stabilized video, the video before the shaking effect has been applied, what you see is this. Bad, shaky acting. And of course, they're never in concert with each other. Nobody shakes all the same. If you had six people on a boat, and the boat all you know hit a wave, everybody would move exactly the same way because they're all being affected by the boat in these things that they're all shaking and moving about and it's it's chaos that's what our world is going through right now they are trying to imply that everything is stable and they're shaken for all they're worth that's the first part of the journey but the good news is found in verses four through seven Let's read those together. But God. Ah, oh, two great words. Now in the NIV, there's a little phrase in between there, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy. But in the original, it's but God, who is rich in mercy. Made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. In order 
that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. But God, that is the gospel right there. So the, this sermon, this is a very Lutheran sermon, by the way. The bad news first and then the good news. So you've heard the bad news. You were dead. The good news is you don't have to stay that way because God intervenes, brings us to life, loved us through his great mercy. His mercy is the means by which his love is seen. And he made us alive. He brought us to life together by joining us to Christ. Boy, there's just all kinds of amazing pictures there. Someone who's been in a, a terrible accident and is going, they've lost so much blood, they're going to die unless they get a transfusion. They get a, a, a fresh supply of living blood. That's what happened to us. We've all been connected to Christ and brought to life because of it. He made us alive by joining us to Christ. That is God's grace in saving action. And this underlines God's work, not our own. The person who has been through the catastrophic car accident and who's brought into the ER broken and isn't going to make it without direct intervention by somebody else doesn't stand up in the midst of their brokenness and say, that's okay, I've got this. I'll just pay my own insurance premiums, by the way, and then everything will be fine. No, it does not work like that. Outside intervention is absolutely required to bring them, to restore them to life. That's what's going on here. And verse 6, look at this. God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. That word raised, uh, it's energized together. We get our word synergy from it. The energy that you have, the energy that you have, the energy that you have all come together and they make something bigger than the sum of its parts. That's synergy. That's the word that's going on here. When we are connected to Christ, Christ does something in us that is more than we can do ourselves. We're energized together and we are seated together. Because, of course, Christ isn't just some source of power. He's not a battery. He is the royalty of the universe. He is the king of the universe. And he has his rightful place on the throne. And Paul is letting the Ephesians and us know that we are to be seated on this same throne. I may have told you the story before. It's a very powerful story for me personally. When I was a little boy, I would go and visit my grandmother and grandfather in their home. And my grandmother was a controlling woman, very much liked things the way they were supposed to be. And my grandfather was just the most patient, loving, just I'm, I'm not going to engage in, I, I will just, I'll love my wife and help her do what she needs to do, and happy wife, happy life. That was my grandpa. So I would go and I would visit, and of course I was the grandson, and I got doted on and all of that. But I didn't really, you know, she never like asked me, you know, what would you like for dinner? She just would tell me, this is what we're having. Okay. But when I was a little boy, my grandpa had this big goldenrod colored recliner, and he would sit me next to him. I would crawl up in his chair and sit with him. And he would say, Billy, bring us cornflakes. Now this is way after dinner. This is like seven o'clock at night. This is truth or consequences, Bob Barker on the television time. We, as a little boy, I didn't need to be eating anything, anything at that time. Oh no, Billy, bring us cornflakes. And my grandmother, who, you know, wanted to rule, the, she would hear that note in his voice and she would bring us a TV tray and two bowls of cornflakes. I had no power. I had no authority. But I got to benefit from the power and authority of my loving grandfather. 
I know my grandmother loved me as well. But the point is, we are seated in a place that we don't deserve to be seated at. And all of the benefits we get from being seated, from being connected with the royalty of the universe, isn't because we are royalty. It's because we've been joined to royalty. We've been adopted into this family. We talked about that a couple of weeks ago. Now, now, we receive because of where we've been placed. Notice verse 7. This is in kindness. This is in kindness for those who are in Christ. And, you know, as I read this uh, a few times, because I like to jump onto verse 8, 9, and 10, but 7 isn't where I'm going to park for a bit. In order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. Now, please don't, under, don't, don't, don't misunderstand me. Jesus is not the means by which he shows us kindness. No. Jesus is the living act of his embodied love for all of us. His kindness is shown to those of us who are in Christ Jesus. Do you see the difference? Here's a true statement. God is love. But love is not God. It does not go the other way. It, it only works in, the, in that direction. From left to right. This, this is your left. Yeah. yeah. It only works in that direction for us. God is love. And frankly, I think this is one of the reasons why the world gets so mistaken. is because they think that the opposite is true. Love is God. So anything I love can be God for me. Well... No. Now, I could put things that aren't God in God's place. I can love ice cream and become diabetic and it'll kill me. I, I, can, I can love my children and have my children's whims uh, make me so crazy <laughs> that I'm unable to parent well. That has happened with some parents, you have to admit. I can love my country. So much so to where country takes the place of God as ultimate authority in our lives. I'm not saying any of us are guilty of that, but I am saying that we are certainly in the midst of watching that play out right now. And for those of you who are watching in a different country, and I know there are a few of you, I don't know what it's like for you. I would love for you to Write me and let me know if that's the same thing where you live. But the truth of the matter is, God is love. It only goes in that direction. We can't assume that the other is correct. It isn't. And that's a big deal because this kindness is for those of us who are in Christ. It doesn't mean that Christ is not the means Kindness is the means. The, the reason why God gives us grace in the first place is because he likes us. God, of course, loves you. You've probably grown up your whole lives hearing God loves you. But I want to make sure you realize that God likes you, too. He thinks you're pretty neat. The, the Old Testament prophet says that God watches over you. God doesn't sleep, but he watches you sleep. And he sings over you like lullabies. God makes up little songs and sings them about you. About you. You are that important to God. And you are so important to God that he brought you to life. He quickened you. That's what that word means. Quickened. To be, to be brought to life. Part of the, uh, one of the historic creeds. But Jesus uh, shall come to judge the quick and the dead, the, the quick are those who are alive. God has brought us to life because he loves us, because he likes us. And God hasn't done this just to leave us out on our own to wander the wastelands of this planet. 
God has done this so that we would be seated with him, that we would be in this place of family love. We are seated right next to Jesus. God brings us to life and joins us together with Jesus and seats us in the heavenly places. Why would any Christian want to live like a zombie instead? Let's pray. Lord God, you bring us to life. You re-energize us by connecting us with Christ. And when we are in Christ, we receive benefits unimaginable, incomparable. We, we cannot accurately compare what we have been given to with what the world offers. Satan has tried to set up this counterfeit kingdom where he's supposedly a king. He's not a king. He's a pretender. He doesn't have access to the throne. So the only thing he can do is to get us to run around and pretend with him. It doesn't work. It doesn't bring us to life. There is no breath of the Spirit in us when that happens. Help us to remember that we are connected to you, Father, Spirit, Son. We are seated and secure. We are adopted and appreciated. You have made us your own, and you are shaping us so that others can see Jesus in us. And this whole process is all for your glory. Help us to cooperate with it in Jesus' name. Amen. And now we will prepare for communion. We will sing, um, I have uh, According to Thy Gracious Word, number 520 in our hymnal, so we'll sing that. Uh, and then we'll uh, celebrate communion. And again, since we are practicing the whole social distancing thing, we'll, uh, I'll come up and, and uh, explain how we're going to do this. And you'll come up one at a time and, and take the elements back to where you're seated. And then we'll go through the, the, the words of the institution together. So let's sing together according to thy gracious word, number 520 in our hymnal. of being brought into 
Jesus' presence because of this meal. And so if you have anything in your heart that you are harboring that you feel would block you from this, let that go. Leave it at the foot of the cross so that you can enjoy free and unfettered relationship with Jesus. So, let's pray together. Lord God in heaven, we ask that you would draw us to yourself. That you would use this cup and this plate as a, a reminder of the meal that we are going to celebrate with you someday in eternity. Help us to remember that, that we are joining you at the big table while we are at the little table right here. Someday, someday. Bless us as we participate in this today. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. If I can have you come forward, we'll receive the elements, and then we'll have to go sit down. On the night in which he was betrayed, Jesus took the bread and broke it and said, This is my body. Do this in remembrance of me. And so we remember that Jesus was broken for us. Lord, we remember, and in some real way, we, we take you in. Bring us to life. On that same night, Jesus took the cup and pouring it, he said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. And as often as you drink it, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And so we proclaim that Jesus died for us, individually and as a race, the human race. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this sacrifice that you have made for us to bring us into your presence, to be seated with you on the throne. Not because of our work, but because of your work on our behalf. We thank you. As we close our service, we'll... Um, have people place their offerings in the plate afterwards. So this is just my reminder to you at home. If you are blessed and ministered to by the, the ministry of this particular congregation, please consider how you might be able to support us. Um, we want your prayers. We really do. Uh, if there's something about which you would like us to pray, please uh, write me an email, post that on Facebook, jot it down, get it to us so we, we can lift you in prayer. Lift us in prayer as well. If you can support us financially, that would be wonderful. If you can come and join us on a Sunday morning, that would be wonderful too. If there are other ministries that are blessing you, support them as well. Let's thank the Lord by singing the doxology together.
praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. And we'll close by singing Trust and Obey, number 368. Uh, Jamie, what key is this in? Oh, good. I can play that one. All right. adorns the poor and binds the rulers and causes the people to rejoice, adorn you with love. Bind all that seeks evil in your life and give you cause to rejoice. Blessed be God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be on you and with all whom you love now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. We're dismissed, everyone.